Welcome back to the Four Gardens podcast. I'm Jake Gifshin. The Four Gardens are an approach I'm developing to cultivate a life of balance, joy, and abundance by focusing on four key areas of life, health, nature, creativity, and service. On this show, I talk to people inspiring me in those four areas. To learn more, go to fourgardenspodcast.com and make sure to like and subscribe to hear new episodes and support this project. My guest today is Omar Aina, creator of Dance Lab, a DJ, and someone who's been a valuable friend in my life over the last few years. He recently took a trip to Iraq to explore his own heritage, and I'm getting back in the flow with him through dance and through the retreats that he's holding. Let's jump right back in. grateful to have you on and i was rocking out jamming to your soundcloud today getting caught up on some of your mixes as i went for a run in prospect park and had to take some dance breaks along the way with my headset on and uh got some looks you know i think the silent discos all of the ones happening all over the city are uh making me more comfortable just dancing with no music and like being witnessed with that but i was really really enjoying your mixes today. awesome awesome yeah my pleasure um you know, releasing music and musical creations online was a bit of an edge for a bit, but, you know, first I just started sharing mixes with close friends and they were just telling me how much they were having similar experiences to you, taking it to the park and just uh, bringing it into their lives in their own ways. So I'm glad it, uh, it's moved you also, it's awesome. I love about it too, is you just, you really do a great job with fusing different styles together. Something I always appreciated about your DJing is you turn me on to different sounds and different influences from around the world that I can tell that you care about. I know from knowing you that you care about these different styles and these artists getting them in. And it, it takes me out of that normal ecstatic dance. There can be some repetitious ecstatic dance songs that kind of get in the mix. And so I just, I just like dig how I'm getting, I'm getting my dance fix and I'm also getting a bit of a cultural like trans transportation, like mental transportation from the music that you share. So that's another quality I enjoy about it. I'm grateful, yeah. Um, music has that ability to, you know, weave together various languages, sounds, instruments that think seemingly sound very different and the languages could be different from one song to another. But for me, what inspires me to make DJ sets and musical mixes is to have a lot of different variety, but still there's a thread that connects them all and the uniting of all of those different cultures into one musical tapestry is always something that I just, I'm very inspired by. Uh, so thank you for saying that. Yeah, you do it really artfully in these sets. And I'm definitely going to work my way through the rest of them over the next days, especially <laughs> in some like, long road trips I have coming will be, uh, it's, it's nice to have that full hour, 90 minutes to move with and to move through a little, a journey that your sets create. And I met you through a cultural experience of, um, we met in Guatemala originally through one of the retreats you held. And so even when I first met you, this you were doing that there, you were fusing different cultures together and bringing people from New York to Guatemala and being a bridge between different types of people and from the United States to different cities were coming together of dance communities. And you were like, I immediately knew you as someone who was interested in creating experiences that brought different cultures and different people together inclusively. Yeah, I mean, that's just kind of in my DNA and my upbringing, because growing up, I went to an international school in New York City. It's called the United Nations International School. So the, the name says it all. It was a place where kids from around the world uh, went to school together. Their parents worked at the UN. So for me, you know, for instance, my group of friends going, growing up, we were all from different places. Like, you know, my best friend was Vietnamese. My other best friend was Polish, another one half Liberian, half Irish, I mean, all over, but we were all like best friends, you know, we were so similar in many ways. Um, so that planted a seed early on uh, where I 
really value diversity. And so now with the experiences that I like to create, they reflect that passion that I have for diversity because there's just so much beauty in our respective traditions and histories and how we express that now. And so creating experiences where people that attend hopefully are from different parts of the world and we're learning about you know, our re respective cultures, um, but also bringing that into a very present and new and uh, you know, modern way of living, that balance is something that I'm very interested in, you know, honoring tradition while also shaping the future in the now, um, bringing all of those elements together. Shaping the future in the now. I like that. And I liked, uh, I was feeling that last night, being back in New York City. Like I feel how New York's part of you, New York City. And when I'm in community with you, we were in circle last night. I'm grateful you brought, brought together a lot of the community. I got to be in circle with you and just the way that the people that are gathering around you. And I think New York City lends itself to this. Like you are able to, I feel like it does. Yes, there's shared interests among the people and shared some shared qualities, but it's a more, it's a more diverse in types of thinking and backgrounds um, dance community than I've experienced other places. It's, it's kind of beyond a dance community. I would say what you're bringing together, who you're bringing together around you, but it's something I'm great. It's one reason I'm in New York city and great for looking for community like this, where there is this, um, and it's something you're like pushing into, like, we'll talk a little bit about, I heard you talking about the trip you just took too, and like going mm -hmm. beyond, you know, building bridges of this community in New York city beyond in the world is one of your intentions. So like not to jump ahead of ourselves, but, uh, let's, um, let's, let's, I'd like to hear about how this trip kind of grew out of, you know, this interest in your, your past and your culture and where that came from. Yeah. Uh, so just for reference, my family is Iraqi. My father comes from the capital city of Baghdad and my mother from the Kurdish city in the north of Iraq, Erbil, um, which is a very unique culture. Um, and they came to the United States in 1980 and I was born, you know, several years after that here in the US. Um, and so growing up here, I would hear the language of Arabic spoken in the house. My parents would talk to each other, but they didn't teach it to me. So I actually didn't grow up speaking the language. And like I said, I went to an international school. Um, and so I was always very curious about other cultures, pretty curious about my own, but like I said, didn't speak the language. I wasn't that connected to my Iraqi heritage. And then 9-11 happened and that was a huge moment, you know, for everybody, for the whole world. It was a, a a shock in many ways, but especially for those that identify as Arab or Muslim, both of which my family identifies with, it was a real shock. And it was a moment of, for me as a teenager, a young teenager, 13 years old, a time when we're seeking belonging the most, where I was basically in a lot of fear and shame and wanted absolutely nothing to do with my Iraqi identity or Muslim identity for that matter. And so honestly, for the next several years while I was in high school, when people asked me where I was from, I would, I would lie. I would say, oh, I'm Turkish or I'm Italian. <laughs> my name is Omar De Caro, some Italian last name. And I really went with that. And it was a matter of social survival. You know, and I realized, you know, a few years ago that I was still carrying a lot of that shame and a lot of that trauma from 9 11, and of course, everything that happened after that in Iraq, in the Middle East. Uh, so I really wanted nothing to do with my Arab identity. Um, and yet, I couldn't escape it. Like, I still gravitate towards, you know, Iraqi and Arab food and textiles and music. So it's just a core, it's in me, it lives inside of me. So though, you know, maybe on one level, I was trying to dismiss it on another level, some part of me was deeply wanting to go into it more and more. 
But what really broke through for me and what really sparked uh, a conscious choice to go into my own roots was when I was in Guatemala in 2019. And it was the second retreat that we did. We did a week long dance retreat in 2018. And then we did the second one in 2019. And while I was there, the two days before the retreat started, and you know this story, but two days before the retreat started, uh, I was DJing an event at a place called Hostel Del Lago. And uh, it was a great time. Packed my stuff once we were done, walked back to the, host the hostel, and uh, I was with my ex-partner at the time. And as I was walking back, two men ran up on us with masks on, gun in hand, and they robbed us both. And they demanded, especially my backpack, which I'm guessing they saw that I had all of my DJ gear. They were probably at the event and they saw me pack up and they probably followed us. Um, so it was a really, really intense moment for both my ex-partner and I. And um, yeah, it, it was, a, it was a, one of those very shocking moments, as you can imagine. Of course. Wow. And it sparked a whole journey for both of us in our own ways and together. But for me, it was especially about uh, the question and the the healing that came was you have spent your whole life especially these last years this was kind of a voice in my head saying you've spent so many years being so fascinated by other cultures and traditions you're organizing these retreats and group trips and these different places around the world it's amazing you're curious about all these places and um traditions but what about your own do you know where you're even from do you know where your people come from? And maybe now is the time that you redirect this energy and bring it back to your own roots. And so it was a difficult confrontation with my own sense of self, but looking back at it, it was such a blessing, you know? And um, so the next few years, since 2019, I have been studying Arabic uh, here in the U.S., I went to an eight-month immersive program in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania. And after that, yeah, I was looking forward to traveling in the Middle East and, you know, wanting to practice my Arabic. Now I speak Arabic with my parents, actually, and that's a beautiful thing. Um, but I wanted to take it one step further and go deeper and to really immerse myself. So I traveled first to Turkey and then to Jordan, Lebanon, and eventually Iraq, where I hadn't been in 21 years. And I hadn't seen, you know, many of my relatives in such a long time. Some of them I had never met before at all. Um, so you can imagine it was a, a big homecoming. And, you know, our tradition, it's such a hospitable culture, you know, whether your family or not, or whether you're just a foreigner, a guest, hospitality is at the center of uh, the values that Arab people as a whole, uh, as in general hold. But especially if you are family, oh, it's over. Like <laughs> you're, you're in this embrace that is just so amazing and so warm. And uh, so it was an incredible trip. I feel very yeah. filled up from it and, um, just to feel in my body a sense of being connected to something greater than myself, which I had intuitively felt, but this made it very, very real. Thanks so much for sharing this. And one thing I'm hearing is the way you told the story, there's really three phases of the story. One was the Guatemala chapter, like this tra traumatic awakening that you had in the recovery period, like immediately after that. And then it seems like that awareness and then I heard a second period too of relearning Arabic and speaking Arabic with your family. And like, there was this, a lot of preparation for this trip and this trip kind of, um, being this, uh, flowering of that interest that grew in you, that awareness, like has flowered into this, this trip and this cultural exchange that you made. But I, I'd love to slow down a little bit and go back and talk about, was that awareness, go back to Guatemala for a minute. Was that awareness Im 
immediate for you or did that come during the healing process and the, the, the integration of it? Like, how did that come through? It came with time. The shock itself was so sudden that the immediacy of what happened demanded just like the full attention um, and just the impact that it had required like full just attention on on being fully present uh, and it happened two days before the retreat started you know over 60 people were getting ready to get on a plane to fly down to guatemala city and i was responsible to make sure that they got from the airport to the retreat center safely so i had so many logistical things to worry about and plan right after this whole thing happened so i was in like emergency mode basically but it was a huge lesson in teaching and leadership and the kind of leadership that it demanded in that moment was not this stoic like just pick myself back up and fight through it and do it all on my own it was one of recognizing i was in a very weak and vulnerable position and I needed help. And to ask those around me, other facilitators who are facilitating the retreat to help me. I need you right now. I, I like, I need all of you to show up. And they did, they truly did. And, um, and so it informed the whole experience of the retreat. And, you know, we didn't shy away from naming what happened. And we brought that into the retreat to talk about you know, very important issues. Okay, well, what were the conditions that led those people to feel like they needed to rob me? What what might have motivated them to do that? What is the condition of this country? And how are we as those that are traveling here possibly feeding into that dynamic and perpetuating that? So it was, it made it a very real <laughs> experience. So to answer your question, I think it was after the retreat, after I had some time to just decompress and process what just happened and what were like the underlying teachings uh, that those answers, which were really just bigger questions, well, that's when it all emerged and it sparked, it sparked the journey from there. Yeah. I. I'm grateful for that team supporting you too. I was there at the retreat. I was a day late and kind of picked the pieces up of the story and was feeling for you as, as I learned more and more through what you posted and shared in the, in the following days and months and uh, sending you a lot of love in that time. And I'm curious because I, I know sadly other people will be in this situation in the future. There's violence in the world. There's like traumatic, you know, um, these things sadly do happen. Um, Curious to hear if you're open to sharing any tools that really helped you in your recovery and your, in your healing and integration of this. First and foremost, like I said, asking for help, you know, uh, identifying who are those close people uh, that can support and show up in that time of need and reaching out and having them hold space for you. Um, course for me dance has always been an outlet for releasing stuck emotions for processing and trying to understand the events of my life so dance was huge um, shortly after that I actually flew to India and I spent two months in India uh, and I was living at an ashram for two months and uh, that that seemed to be what I needed as well, was just quiet, you know, just a place to uh, let everything digest on its own. Um, so it was a very quiet month for me, uh, two months actually. But looking in retrospect, what I, if I could say what I wish I had done in a way, I say that no, no, no regrets, but you know, one thing is, I have since learned about certain techniques like, for instance, somatic experiencing. And the idea behind it is uh, if we observe animals in nature, when they have, uh, let's say, traumatic incident happen where, let's say, uh, a deer or another animal is attacked by another animal, uh, 
Uh, and if they survive that attack, often what you'll find is that these animals will shake immediately after the event happens as a way of just releasing the shock of the experience. And there's actually a lot of wisdom in that, you know, to immediately yeah, release. Absolutely, absolutely. And if every time we experienced an, an, a shocking incident, we took that moment to just shake and release whatever we might have just taken on, I think we would have a lot less, you know, tension and trauma that lives in the body from having not processed that. So somatic experiencing was something that I had learned about after the fact. And uh, had I known, I probably like right away would have just spent 10 minutes <laughs> just shaking and just releasing that. So yeah, those are some tools. And so, you, yeah, I think that there's, without that training, without those tools, there's a contraction and like holding in the body that happens during these traumas. We're not prepared. I think socially, societally, not prepared to, to deal with somatic implications of trauma or shock. And so I think that's a great starting point to offer people and just recognizing that asking for help, what you did, that just opening up about it was, is, is a great lesson for others out there. And is what I work with too, of just being open and vulnerable and willing to say, I can't handle this on my own. Uh, yeah. we're, we're not meant to go through these traumas together, like alone. They're not, they're much more difficult to manage, perhaps impossible, some of them without support from other humans and other people. So I just honor you did that too in, in, in real time. So that was good work with that. And wanting to move to, to see, and the realization came slowly, you said, during the healing, the, the returning to roots, the who am I and where, where like this going, this going outward, going back. Um, that happened during the ashram moving forward, kind of grew in you slowly, or was it like an all at once flash that this is? Yeah. So when I was at the ashram, uh, every day there were daily teachings and they were rooted in Vedanta specifically, uh, which is part of the Vedas. And it was taught in English, but every day there were morning and afternoon prayers that were taught in Sanskrit. And this was in Rishikesh, India, which if you know, is along the Ganges River, beautiful river, which, you know, the people in that part of the world and in India, they have such reverence for Mama Ganga, you know, it's like a living motherly energy. And every day there were these prayers in Sanskrit and they were beautiful. And I enjoyed hearing them, but I think that was what was sparking this deeper desire to reconnect with Arabic and the language of Arabic. Like as I was hearing the Sanskrit, it was beautiful, but I felt disconnected from it. And something inside was like, go to your language, the language that lives in your DNA and your blood. And there was like a, a craving. I, I was craving just like tasting the, the sounds of Arabic. And I knew a little Arab, very little at that time. Um, but I was, uh, it sparked something deep inside. So when I came back from India, that was when I started to research and look up programs that, uh, that I could learn Arabic. And uh, I found different ones, but yeah, I was ready for an immersion. Like <laughs> that's just the nature of my personality. Like I don't dabble in things. It's like, yeah, I could have just taken classes once <laughs> or twice a week and whatever. But I was like, oh, like go move somewhere and like, live and immerse six hours a day for, you know, what was eight months. Uh, and to this day, I'm still continuing, not as intensively. Um, but yeah, it was just this step by step kind of process of following that initial spark and that initial urge that was kind of mysterious at first, but then it became more and more clear. Um, and then that led to not just learning Arabic, but then learning about the spiritual tradition of my ancestors, the Islamic tradition, which is also something that I very much distanced myself from for, you know, the better part of my teenage years and adult years. And, uh, and I opened up to the possibility of, you know, reconnecting to that tradition. And yeah, I've learned so much in it and so much beauty, and so much knowledge and information that has 
been distorted and misused from the Islamic tradition that now I have such reverence for. Um, so it, it's still continuing. As you can see, it's like first it started with language, then it went into the spiritual tradition. And now I'm fascinated just with history in general, the history of Iraq, you know, the cradle of civilization, you know, the, the first real, you know, civilization that we know of uh, from that land. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to those places now, uh, historically speaking. I like how it started with that taste from from the river, from the the language, and uh, yeah, I, re I resonate with that. How that could that feels um, like this interesting way, like poetic way to start on a spiritual journey too. And to to get into the spiritual aspect to Sufism, you mentioned to me earlier was a uh, has been an interest of yours as well, a part of this. And I'm not someone who studied Sufism intensely or understanding it well, and. Uh, uh, if you're open to sharing how Sufism has like played a role in your spiritual growth uh, these last years as you study your traditions. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Sufism is the mystical part of the Islamic tradition. Um, it's the core of the Islamic tradition. And it's what I believe to be the experiential dimension of the Islamic spiritual tradition, meaning, you know, one can study religion from a very intellectual standpoint, and one can practice religion from a outward standpoint where you maybe observe certain rituals and you do the different practices, um, but it might lack an inner dimension that allows for real transformation to take place. And so Sufism for me is that trans transformational dimension of, of the Islamic tradition. And it is very much connected with other mystical paths from other religions and other traditions as well, which all have a shared goal, which is to merge with the universal consciousness, to go from the individual to the universal, to go from the ego identity to that boundless space of love, wisdom, awareness. And so Sufism is one path that can lead people to that reality. I can't, you know, I'm not claiming to have gotten there, but um, it's very much the path of the heart, the path of devotion, the path of invoking the beloved, as is often said, the beloved being the divine. And uh, there's this courting that can happen between the seeker and the beloved. And um, so Sufism can really take somebody on a, a path of purification to culminate into a unity with all that is. And there are really incredible practices invoking the names of God. That's called uh, dhikr, which literally means remembrance the remembrance of God. And um, so it played such an important part of my path because growing up, I was not introduced to this dimension of the tradition. For me, it was all about the outward aspect of it. And there was a lot of fear surrounding it. What happens if I don't do this? What are the consequences after I die? All of those things that just made me have a distaste for the religion. But when I discovered Sufism, it really resonated because it went from a fear-based path to a love-based path. And it connected with many other wisdom traditions from around the world. And for me, that is very important. Like I, I can't subscribe to something that claims to be the one and only truth. Instead, I believe that, you know, there are many paths to the one. And Sufism in many ways uh, acknowledges that. There are different branches of Sufism, so different groups and different people will have varying opinions, just like any, you know, any uh, spiritual community. I like the introduction I've had to Sufism is through the poetry and through the dance of it. I feel like that's the, like yeah, maybe a that's, lot of Western people have had that glimpse of what Sufism is about without uh, moving beyond, you know, that introduction or that little taste of it. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I know what you mean. I've experienced that here in the U.S. And that's beautiful. You know, I'm happy to hear that, you know. And I've had that ex experience, too. And it gives people like a direct taste of, uh, of the reality that it can invite us into. But I think it's really important. And I, th I found where I was uh, moving towards was wanting to go to the source of where this tradition comes from. So yeah, the art, the poetry, the dance, uh, that was all amazing. But I was like, okay, what is this connected to though? And for a lot of folks, I think Sufism, they might not know that it's a part of Islam. Like they're inextricably linked. And for some folks, they might think Sufism is just its own thing. Uh, people think about the poet Rumi. Right. You know, mystic poet from Persia, all about you know love, divine love. And his poetry, just reading it, can you know take you to that ecstatic state. And a lot of folks don't know that Rumi was an Islamic jurist in Iran um, before having been introduced to his teacher and basically having mystical experiences with his teacher. But he's very much rooted in traditional Islamic thought and education and development. So. I feel it's important to make sure that there's an awareness of, you know, how Sufism is very much connected to the roots of Islam. And uh, there can be a beautiful harmony when bringing those two together, because they're not separate. They're the same, they're, they're one. They're, you know, Sufism is just the inner core of the greater Islamic, you know, tradition. Thanks for giving that whole, whole holistic, I guess, the word for it, perspective on Sufism and Islam, because I do feel like it's been offered to me as a, a poetic or secular almost tradition when clearly like the Rumi is a great example. He's the one I hear the most of his work. I, I hear a lot of Rumi poems lately being read by people. I'm pretty, would have a story are not connecting that it's growing out of an Islamic tradition, an Islamic scholar, a jurist is bringing, is bringing this work to them and this, and this insight. Uh, and so I think that's an important message just to remember, we sh I mean, I think it's a little wishful thinking or that it's incorrect to separate the, the two or inaccurate. Um, and, and it's worth examining why we're doing that too, I think. And uh, I'm curious about, so I have some ideas, but I think that bringing that back together is important. And so you started, I'm hearing you started, um, stu Sufism came to life for you in the last few years though, this study understanding the history as you mentioned was part of your journey and also the language you started studying uh arabic last year is that right mm, it was uh 20 the fall of 2019 and it was supposed to go for basically a full school year from september through june obviously COVID happened in march so we transitioned from being in school together and then it went virtual and you were speaking with your parents too, or uh, Arabic speakers, and you were able to communicate with them uh, more and more, it's, it's, it sounds like. And I'm like meeting them for the first time in a way. Like people, yeah, they are different people when they speak wow. their native tongue. Like when I talk to my father in English, which is all I've known him by growing up, like, you know, he's an immigrant who has, you know, had a, a difficult life and he's like struggling and, you know, has made many sacrifices and is a beautiful man. Obviously, you know, for me, he embodies so many beautiful values. But when he speaks in Arabic and when I communicate with him in Arabic, he turns into this eloquent, intellectual, poetic, deep thinker that I just never knew him as because maybe he's not able to communicate that level of depth in his second language in English. So I'm now meeting my parents in a completely new way. And now I have such uh, reverence and respect for them because now I can meet them in their, in their comfort zone and like their true essence. Wow. That's, prof that's profound to know them that this, this knowing them in their own language or knowing them that, that, that depth is a really beautiful piece of this story. Um, and, and to also share spiritual, the spiritual path with them, to share yes. prayer with them, to now 
uh, be aligned with how we connect to God, to the divine, to that which is greater than us, to share those practices with them is incredibly meaningful. You know, it feels, it just feels like something is being passed down to me. And when I share these practices with them, and I have my father to the left and my mother to the right, it's like, there's something that feels so natural about that formation and that something very meaningful has come down. It seems important too that you did that reconnection with them before taking the journey to go to the extended family too, that there's a natural sequence, I feel like, of this starting at home, starting with the people closest to you. Of the, you got, I, I didn't know this piece of the story too, that you connected this way to your parents in a new way. And it adds, like, how did that lead to the next piece for you of like, once you having this family connection of going beyond the immediate family was the next step for you, right? I was taking this trip back. And it seems like that you have such a, a wide family tree and line that's was ready to welcome you in Iraq when you got back there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was something that I was hoping for and was looking forward to while I was in the Arabic program. But of course, COVID happened and the idea of traveling abroad was just compromised. Also, just traveling in the Middle East, even without COVID, is a delicate thing. Like, it's an unstable place in many ways. At least that's the narrative, right? Um, and my actual experience in some ways was that, but it actually wasn't as, you know, dangerous or, you know, as bad as folks might think. But yeah, I, I was, I was in a way planning for this trip for a long time. I was just waiting for the right time. And once, you know, it became clear, okay, COVID is, is just here. It's not just going to disappear. So I just made the decision like, okay, I'm, I, I want to live my life and I want to, continue to fulfill the things that I really want to do. And so this trip was one of them. And so yeah, in August, I just booked the ticket. And the first half of the trip, I traveled with my roommate from Arabic school, who's now like my best friend, brother, uh, who actually is still in the Middle East because he fell in love so much with that place. And we traveled together for about a month. And then when it came time for me to go to Lebanon and then Iraq, that's when we split up. Um, so yeah, uh, it was it was really, really special. We went to Turkey first and it was amazing, don't get me wrong, but you know, they speak Turkish and culture is very rich and so much natural beauty, so much architectural beauty history, all of that, it was inspiring. But when I got to Jordan, which was the first country that I got to in the Middle East, and I finally heard Arabic being spoken in the streets, I was like, this is what I'm here for, you know? And uh, yeah, that, that was definitely a, the beginning of that chapter. And uh, I felt like, okay, let's do this. I like that moment of arrival of hearing Arabic for the first time, because things have been set in motion over a lot of years for that moment of the studying, the awareness, everything that happened in Guatemala and all that journey of even going further back to being the younger version of you that was resistant to that Arab identity that didn't was resistant to speaking Arabic and to embracing your culture. And like, I just think that moment's beautiful of you landing in an Arab speaking country for the first time with having Arabic as a, in your in your uh, lexicon now, like being able to understand yeah. and like connect, fi like finally there you are. So that seems like a really beautiful moment when you land there and get to connect for the first time that way. Yeah, it was, it was. Um, and in Jordan, you know, because every country has their own unique dialect, but Jor Jordanian Arabic is quite, you know, they have their their slang or their own way of saying things, but for the most part, it's a pretty neutral style of Arabic. So it was a great starting point. <laughs> and then when you get to Iraq, like <laughs> their style is uh, a very rich textured flavor of Arabic that is super unique. Yeah. And 
once you got there, it sounded like there were external fears around or like a message that you were deciding you're consciously choosing about the Middle East, about traveling right now, about like, like for you, was it, it sounds like it's something you're really called to do is to go and that you weren't going to, but did you feel, was there like these mis these conceptions or other ideas that have been planted in you that you were shedding as you went through this trip about what people were going to be like or how safe this was, or is that something you'd kind of already before the trip had kind of researched and let go of? How was that for you? Uh, I did research, uh, but the research was trying to reinforce the idea of it being a really bad idea to go. <laughs> <laughs> and even my own father, you know, was very resistant to me going. He was super scared of me going to Iraq. Uh, he was afraid that I would, you know, get kidnapped by militia groups and, you know, that any number of things can happen. I mean, it's my father being a father. Fathers are protective. And so looking back, I, I understood it. But yeah, like you said, I just, I felt called to do it. And it's, you know, once inside of me, there was like a, a determination. I'm stubborn, I guess. Like I just knew I had to do it and, and learn for myself if I just have the experience for myself and to not let these external ideas of the Middle East, uh, the imagery that is often depicted about Middle East in the modern, you know, times. I had to just go paint that picture for myself and how different of a picture it was. Don't get me wrong, like I said, it was, there, there is a real element of what is being depicted. And of course, a country that has been going through war for 30, 40 years, you're gonna experience the repercussions of that. And I very much did, but there's another dimension that you can't possibly know about unless you, actually directly experience it. And that's for me, the experience of connecting with people, being inside the houses and like living the daily lives, you know, with the folks that are, have been there and haven't, you know, left or escaped or fled, but they've, they've stayed there and the resilience and through all that struggle to still witness the ability for people to experience joy and uh, laughter and like, you wouldn't think that there was so much suffering and difficulty if you were, you know, just hanging out with some of the folks that I got to spend time with. Like they are, it's just so ingrained in the characters of people in the Arab world to persevere and to find ways to uh, still enjoy the moment with whoever they're with and to share like the generosity for me was just overwhelming <laughs> like how people that have so little are able to give so much and yet to come from a place or live in a place where seemingly we have so much and yet you know greed is rampant and folks can't necessarily give a lot of what they have which is you know more than enough you know, I, I spent time with folks that like, they didn't have much of anything and yet sharing was what nourished them. Like if there was any food at all, we're sharing it, you know, um, and the satisfaction that comes from that. So it was so, so important to experience that for myself. And yeah, my, my father's resistance very much changed once I was actually there and he, I said, I was sending him pictures. I even went to his old childhood home where he grew up and I took a picture from right outside of his old childhood home and the neighborhood that he was, that he grew up in. And when I sent him that picture, it like, it melted his heart, you know? Can and imagine. from there, it, he, he, he really realized, oh, this is a very important trip you're doing. I'm, I'm retracing this, you know, I retraced the steps of, you know, my ancestors and my family, so. It was, it wasn't just meaningful for me. It was meaningful for my parents and for, you know, many other relatives who welcomed me and uh, understood what my intention was. Yeah, it feels like you were really kind of reweaving or weaving for the first time, like in your case of con connections with these people that are in your family that have this shared history that 
that love you, you know, want to love you and care for you and give you gifts. And so it is this beautiful example of using travel as uh, a way, as, as a gift in itself, as a way that's like going beyond your experience of the place. Like your experience is obviously important, um, but it's, it's this like communal travel that you're doing, this cultural uh, coming together that I really, I really love the way you did this. And you didn't just do it in a way that's like, I mean, if, if you'd just done that, it would have been still an amazing trip, but you also had gifts to share on the way of going there. You brought your art to this trip. And I'd love to hear a little more about the way you use dance and DJing to bring people together while you were there and get, and you gave back to those communities too, in a pretty cool way. So yeah, I'd love if you could share about that. Yeah. Well, to start for me, like the journey of DJing, you know, several years ago, uh, obviously, as we've spoken about, bringing in world music has always been important, but I always loved Middle Eastern music. Obviously it's, you know, core to who I am and playing music from the Middle East at events here in New York. It's just awesome, you know, but yeah, also being able to play and share, you know, these passions that I have out in the Middle East was so, so special as well. And I was pleasantly surprised. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if uh, I would meet people while I was in these countries that were open and receptive to ecstatic dance, to, you know, these kinds of events. But I was uh, so pleasantly surprised when I got to Jordan, I found and connected to a beautiful community of artists, um, of space holders, facilitators, healers, like, you know, it felt like they were just an extended part of my community in, in New York and the US. Um, but they were also Arab. And so to share these, what I thought were separate parts of my own identity, to see them all integrated in the same place was amazing. So yeah, we did two events in Amman, Jordan, the capital of Jordan. Both of them were on rooftops and uh, just, you know, with a view of pretty much the whole city. And I got to collaborate with some really amazing people. One of them was a whirling teacher. So Sufi whirling is a type of Sufi dance. And so she taught that class and then I followed up by playing about an hour and a half DJ set. And yeah, the response was amazing. So much so that they wanted to do another event the week after that they just put together last minute. And that was also really, really special. So it just felt so good to, yeah, share, you know, this passion in that part of the world, but also to just know that that community exists and to feel like I can go there and connect with them and help water the seed of what they're doing there is something that I'm holding as an intention for the future, you know, and very much wanting to return and do more. But what was equally, if not more powerful was when I went to Lebanon afterwards and we did an ecstatic dance in Lebanon outside of Beirut. And if you know at all, like in Lebanon now, you know, since last year, especially, there was a big ex explosion that happened um, along the pier. And yeah, people have been in a state of shock and um, it's a failed system, basically, a failed governmental system that has let down a lot of the people of Lebanon. And it's been a very difficult year for them. So the idea was presented to go to Lebanon and do an ecstatic dance there. I had gone four years ago to do the first ecstatic dance in Lebanon and met this incredible group of people, community that also welcomed me so warmly. And since when I left, they continue to do ecstatic dances over the years. But, you know, this past few months, I got to go back and they really wanted to do another one. And you know, the friends that I had there were just saying, Omar, come to Lebanon, like, let's do, let's do a dance here. Like people need it. We really need it. And when I heard them say that, we need this, come. I was like, all right, I don't care 
what's happening. Like I'm going <laughs> to find a way to get there. Dance superhero. So I had to, like, this is why this is, this is it. Like, this is why I, I it works. Yeah. And so flew there. They, uh, picked me up from the airport. I mean, to even drive anywhere is such a challenge. There's no gas. There's such a shortage of gas. Like if you want to wow. fill up your tank of gas, you'll have to go to the gas station and you might have to wait five, six hours just to fill your tank. So it was no small thing for me to get there and for them to pick me up. And like, it was a, a process, you know, but they were committed to it. I was committed to it and we made it happen. And, uh, spent the night and then the next day we had the event it's a beautiful property it was somebody's home with a outdoor area overlooking the capital city of beirut overlooking the mediterranean sea it was just so magical and about 50 60 people came um and they were fully committed to the to the journey you know and i just had this very clear memory of playing that set playing music and I played this one song and it was a Palestinian song, Palestinian hip hop group called 47 Soul. Before that, like, you know, the first 30 minutes of the DJ set, I was playing all kinds of stuff from around the world. But when I played that track, it was like I ignited this fire in the group and it was just like, you know, and there was something about playing, you know, the music of the Middle East while I was there and it, it just erupted and uh, yeah, such a special experience. And I'm so grateful I got to go and yeah, sharing ecstatic dance, sharing music there was, was amazing. And I definitely want to go back and do it again. Oh man, I'm getting some goosebumps though with a 47 soul reference. Cause I grew up with Ramsey. Um, from 47 nice. Soul, um, one of the, the, the keyboard player in the band. And he was really coming into my awareness. Um, I was thinking about like quoting him, a thing he said about Arabic earlier, I decided not to, but um, he, uh, his, well, the, what, what I was gonna say is he had a line that stuck with me that Arab, that, um, that Arabic, uh, he said the liquor is in the language, he would say. He, he, Cause the, you know, it's an alcohol free, society for the most part. And he would say that we get our liquor in the, in the words and the language. I just remember him saying that really clearly. Um, when we were, when he was learning Arabic, we were younger. And, uh, I think about the Arab cultures too, as being this, um, like fertile place for, to share the ecstatic modality, especially the way you do, where you, you mix in Arabic music to it and Middle Eastern music, um, has a, fl a flavor that would be familiar to them the way you DJ. And also that it is a culture where um, alcohol isn't so dominant as it is here. And, you know, one, for people who aren't familiar with ecstatic dance, that's one of the main tenets of it is that it's a sober, a sober experience. And so I could see how, um, there are like different factors working in your favor for adoption of ecstatic dance. And I love that it was a 47 soul song that like lit them all up because I've seen them live and they're so good. And, um, that's great that it's like, I have to send this clip to them. Um, of you saying that they're going to love that. Uh, that that that's the case and yeah because they, they they'll do that that music the sham step intro to sham step that yeah. was the track yep <laughs> i know the song i mean it just it it was like a volcano erupted <laughs> and then from there i was like oh okay like let me throw some more of these kinds of tracks in and so for the rest of the set i was playing a lot a lot of different kinds of like electronically infused arabic songs and I mean, it was awakening something deep inside. And afterwards, people were coming up to me saying, thank you so much for, you know, bringing some of those songs in from our heritage. Like it, it awakened something deep inside. And that meant so much to get that feedback. Yeah, that's... Yo, thank you, Ramsey, if you see this yeah, clip. Thanks, big, big up, big respect. Yeah, he's another friend who's um, grew up in the U.S. and's really re like reclaimed his Palestinian heritage and it's touring the world with them and i got to see them before covid and yeah amazing live show definitely check them out maybe i'll throw a link in the in the descriptions too at the bottom here if people want to uh, it's it's worth uh hyping them a little more too for anyone who's curious um yeah man it's this has been 
Yeah, I'm just feeling feeling this conversation, feeling the emotions of this whole of this whole journey. And uh, yeah, so coming back though, let's uh, you had this experience there. Coming back, what's the continuation of this? What's what's next? How can yeah? yeah. What can we share more now? Yeah, um, it was such a big big trip that you know I've, I've needed a few weeks to just kind of let it let it do its thing. But I'm. I'm very committed to what we're doing here in New York and cultivating more community gatherings here. Um, so Dance Lab is the event series that I'm producing and it's very similar to the Tenets of Ecstatic Dance, a free form dance space, sober, no drugs, no alcohol, just come as you are, move as you wish. We also bring in a uh, different dance modality in the beginning, so for the first part of the session will have a guided portion. And then after that is usually the DJ and that's a free form, just move however you wish. And we close with some kind of sound meditation. So I'm very committed to that. We're doing an event next Saturday uh, in Prospect Park. And yeah, man, can't wait to see you. It's going to be a collaboration with another crew, The Get Down. So, yeah, I think my experience in the Middle East was such a collaborative journey that I'm very inspired by, and I always have been, like collaboration has always been core to everything that I've done, but especially now, really wanting to connect and curate experiences with other crews, other communities, and to just you know, expand the web because there are a lot of circles that are doing great things, a lot of circles, um, you know, that are engaged in this similar kind of process and practices and conversations. Um, and so I'm, I'm wanting to reach out to them and to just introduce our community to other communities and to find ways to, to, to dance together, essentially. So we'll see, we'll see where it leads. Like I said, I'm very inspired to already uh, go back to the Middle East. I definitely have a dream of 2022 doing some kind of ecstatic dance festival in the Middle East. That would be the first of its kind that can bring together the small communities from, you know, when I went to Amman, Jordan, and then when I went to Lebanon, I just felt like, oh my God, these two communities need to meet each other and come together. So I don't know how it could happen, but um, I, I definitely have that intention of creating some kind of space next year that can bring together, you know, anybody from that region that feels called to being in that kind of space. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful vision. I'd love to follow along and maybe attend that, that festival when it yeah. comes, when it comes yeah. to fruition uh, in 2022. It's not that far away. Wow. And so, yeah. So for people who want to follow along with, um, with, with your, with that festival or other offerings you're doing, they can follow dance lab, right? Is that the best place to stay updated? Yeah. Also my personal Instagram, Omar underscore Aina, um, is always a great way to stay connected with me. We'd love to connect with anybody that resonates with whatever was shared in this podcast. If anything resonated, uh, I want to, I want to be friends with you. <laughs> um, but yeah, dance lab underscore NYC for events happening with dance lab and for music, check out my SoundCloud page, Omar Aina. And yeah, that's it. I'll share those links below so you can click right on them to anyone watching this video, or if you're listening to this on Spotify, it should be there too. So definitely check all of Omar's music out. I recommend right now, go put some music on. Uh, mm -hmm. I, think I will too rock out to it. Um, again, mm -hmm. like there's, as I said in the beginning, it's, uh, it's at the top of my queue right now. And I'm just really grateful for you coming on today, sharing so vulnerably about this journey you've had. I have a lot more questions for you, but I feel like this is a great, a great starting conversation to get me and everyone caught up on the, the really rich and powerful journey you've taken over the last few years. So really thanks again for coming on and sharing. My pleasure, Jake. I'm so like, wow, an hour flew by. Um, you know, I really enjoy connecting with you, talking with you. You're a person that I consider a 
person of deep integrity, clarity, groundedness. So love what you're doing. Um, I support you every step of the way. And thank you for this invitation. Receive that. Grateful for that. Blessings on you, Omar. And thanks again for coming on. Yeah, man. Much love. That was my conversation with Omar Aina. Thanks again to him for coming on. I love that guy. Wow. What a story. What a, ah, I'm, I need to do my integration now uh, after that. And um, I'm grateful to be in community with him in New York right now. And I'm sure I'll have more, more questions for him and more updates to share uh, as, I, as I keep dancing with his community and, um, in, and a lot of podcasts coming from the, the people in this uh, that I've connected to through Omar, including uh, Marta Pasquale is coming on uh, to share about School of Wonder. Check that out and a few others coming up soon. So stay tuned. Uh, if you want to follow the Four Gardens, remember Four Gardens Podcast at gmail.com. Also check out our Facebook page and leave any comments there or questions. I'd love to receive any uh, input or feedback on the episode too. So you can email us at fourgardenspodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening and keep growing out there.